Hi, and welcome back. It's day three of your 10-day transformation. How are you feeling? I hope that you were able to complete yesterday's assignment and make the commitment to take 100% responsibility for your life so you can give yourself the power to change it for the better. That's pretty huge stuff. And if you haven't completed it yet, don't worry, you have time. But I do encourage you to schedule some time in the next day or so to get it done. It's a hugely powerful exercise that will have a big impact on your life. Now today I'd like to help you go a bit deeper with this exercise and reclaim your power from the people, the circumstances, and the events that you feel have been holding you back so you can regain 100% control over your life. But first, a question. Do you ever feel like you're a victim of circumstance? Maybe you had a tough upbringing with parents who didn't teach you the lessons you needed to learn to create a successful life. Maybe your spouse has been holding you back by dismissing your ambitions or attacking your self-esteem. Or maybe government cuts or layoffs resulted in the loss of your job, business, or career. If you've experienced any of these situations in your life, I feel for you. I understand how painful these things can be. But the time has come to let them go. It's time to stop playing the blame game. The only thing you truly have control over in this life is you. And the sooner you stop wasting energy on blaming other people or events for your circumstances, the sooner you can reclaim that control and create the life you truly want. Now, blame can be a hard thing to let go of, but you've got to understand how much power you're giving to the people or the events that you're blaming. You're letting them prevent you from moving forward. That's not what you want, is it? So to help you regain total control over your life, here's that gift I promised a free video that will teach you how to stop playing the blame game once and for all. First, you're going to create a list of five to 10 blaming behaviors you are going to eliminate from your life from this point forward. For example, I'm no longer going to blame my parents for my lack of success in life. Then I want you to go create a list of new behaviors you're going to use to reclaim total power over your own life. For example, Whenever I feel resentment towards my parents, I'm going to consciously practice love and gratitude instead. This is really powerful, and it's going to have a profound impact on your life. Now, if you're feeling really motivated, I'd like you to share one or more of your new behaviors with my community by posting them in the comments below. And the last step is especially powerful, because when you share your intentions with a supportive community, you're far more likely to make them a reality. So I look forward to reading what you share, and I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. And the third core prerequisite, I think the most pre important prerequisite, it's the one I wrote my first chapter in my book, and it's there for reasons first, is you must take 100% responsibility for your life and for the results you produce. That means you have to give up all blaming, all complaining, all excuse making, and this is not easy to do. It's habitual. Most of us just habitually go there. You know, it's their fault. We look for placing blame somewhere. And so we have to give that up. Most of you know this because many of you have read the book, and, but we'll just review it really quickly. E plus R equals O was a formula I learned from a therapist when I was living in Los Angeles. And his name was Bob Resnick, wonderful man. And it goes like this, events plus responses equal outcomes. And when you don't get the outcomes you want, what most people do is they blame the event. It's the economy, it's the Japanese, now it's the Chinese, you know, or the Indians. In other words, well, we've got all these countries that are coming up that are competing for the goods that we've always taken for granted in the United States, okay? Uh, we blame the world economy, we blame the, the devaluation of the dollar, you know? We used to have a great situation, I go to Europe now, the euro's not worth, you know, my dollar's not worth a euro, all of a sudden dinner is like, you know, a third again as expensive. People in Canada come to the United States, you have the same experience. So we want to blame things outside ourselves, our parents, the way we were raised, you know, the, corporate, the corporations of the world, you know, the military, George Bush, Clinton, whoever. If it wasn't for them, things would be better. And the fact is, those things just are the way they are. As my friend John Enright says, the world's just out there worlding. <laughs> it's just doing what it does. It just is. It's the existential reality of life. And the only power you have is over your response. 
And only three responses you have, the thoughts you think, the images you hold in your head, and the behaviors, which include speaking, what you say. That's it. You can't manage anything else. You can't manage others, can't manage time. You can manage yourself in relation to those things, what you say, what you do, what you think, what you imagine. So we're going to focus a lot this week about what are the responses that highly successful people do. We've studied them for years. Okay? We've interviewed them, we've studied them, we've examined them, we know who they are, we know what they do, and they do things differently than people who aren't as successful. And so you can, this is all learnable. There's nothing here that can't be learned by you or anyone else so that you can have exactly what you want or what they have. So some responses produce better outcomes. Now sometimes we don't know what the outcome will be. First time we went to the moon, we didn't know, okay? We had to just take a risk. So that R can also stand for risk. You're experimenting. You're seeing if it works or not, okay? One of my favorite examples of this, we were running a couples course. And we had this couple, she was married to a lawyer. And the two of them came together, a woman and a man. And one of the sessions was, a, I think, a 16-week course, every Thursday night for four months. And about the eighth night, she came alone. So where's your husband? He couldn't make it. Where is he? He's the law office. He has a brief to prepare. It's got to be in court by tomorrow at 10. He couldn't come. Great. So we just had one of the assistants sit in. Well, what emerged was that she was really unhappy in her relationship. That he would come home, and he would sit in front of the TV. He'd look at the camera, I mean the, te the television screen. He'd also have a newspaper in his hand, cigarette in one hand, drink in the other. So here he is, like surrounded. Paper, drink, cigarette. TV. She said, I can't get his attention. Now, if you've read Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, you know that men need to go into their cave at the end of a day. But the point was, she wasn't real happy about it. So she was blaming him. And many of the other women in the group chimed in, yeah, it's those men, they don't understand, they're insensitive, they come home, and we've been alone all day, you know, blah, blah, blah. She was getting a lot of agreement. Well, all that agreement won't change the situation. Okay? Makes you feel a little better, misery enjoys company kind of thing. But the fact was, we said, look, stop. Let's assume for a minute, it's not the event called your husband, it's not the TV, it's not the newspaper, it's not the drink, it's not the cigarette, it's you. What could you do to be more interesting than the news? What could you do to be more interesting and engaging than his cigarette and his drink? So instead of blaming him, because that's more interesting, I can't compete with it, maybe you could. What could you do? So we brainstormed five or six things she could try on as a risk, as an experiment. We didn't know if they're going to work or not. She goes home. She comes back the next week. She's all smiles. So what happened? Oh, man, that stuff worked. What would you do? So well, the first day he came in, he sat down, plunked down at his newspaper. He's got his drink. He's got his cigarette. He's got the TV blaring. I went in the bedroom, she said, took off all my clothes, glued raisins all over my body. <laughs> Ran out, jumped in front of the screen and said, hi, I'm a raisin cookie. <laughs> Are you hungry? <laughs> she said, I had his attention. <laughs> now we said, well, obviously you can't go around naked with raisins on your body all day long. <laughs> Did you do that all week long? She said, no, the second day he came in, sat down with his newspaper and everything. I went over, I took a pair of scissors, I cut a big hole in his newspaper, stuck my head through and said, hi, honey, welcome home. <laughs> Now, all of a sudden, she was becoming engaging and playful and risk-taking and experimental and more fun, more interesting, instead of being what? Pissed off, angry, resentful, and who wants to talk to someone who's mad at you? See? So we have choices. Sometimes we don't know what those choices are. We know that what we're doing isn't working, but we don't know what will work. But there are places to turn. Success leaves clues. Success leaves clues. There are books like Men Are From Mars like Tannenbaum's work on communication, like uh, Harville Hendricks, getting the love you want. I mean, there's all kind of clues out there of things you can do, okay? Harville Hendricks tells a really cute story. His wife, he wants to share his love with her. And she no he noticed that whenever she would share love with other people, she'd buy them flowers. So one day, he sends her a bunch of flowers. And he comes home expecting, as he used to say, my reward. You know, she'd come up and hug him and kiss him and say, oh, honey, I love you. Thank you. And he walked in, nothing. And he said, did you get the flowers? And she said, yeah. He said, well, didn't you like them? Well, 
Not particularly. Well, honey, every time you want to tell people you care about them, you send them flowers. She says, well, that's what they want. He says, well, what do you want? She said, a card. I like cards. <laughs> so the next day he goes and he buys this big, like three foot big Snoopy card, right? I mean, biggest one they had in the, in the store. And he has it delivered to the house. And he comes home and he said, I was expecting my reward. Nothing. And he says, did you get my card? She says, yeah. Well, didn't you like it? He says, no. Well, you said you liked cards. I know, but I don't like the kind that are funny, sarcastic, Snoopy, Charles Schulz. He said, I like the ones that are kind of like they have a piece of art on the front, like the one you buy at a museum store, and inside there might be a really wise saying or something really beautiful and meaningful. So he runs down to the Metropolitan Museum and he buys a <laughs> Monet, you know, a picture painted by Monet, and he sends it to her, and he comes home, and she almost leaps on him. Now, he tried two things that didn't work. He didn't give up. And he even asked her, but he didn't get the full story. He didn't give up, and then he got the result. And life is going to be like that sometimes. You're going to have to experiment. What works with one child doesn't work with another. They're different. What works with one person doesn't work with another. What works with one client doesn't work with another. But if you take this idea that if there's an event plus your response, and you don't get the outcome you want, you just keep changing until you get the outcome. Now, sometimes the, outcome, the response means you have to go somewhere else. Maybe that the person you have a crush on is never going to fall in love with you. So you quit doing that response, because that's not working. But the point being, if you experiment long enough, you start producing the outcomes you want. And in simple mathematics, 2 plus 2 equals 4. If you don't like 4, the E is not going to change. You've got to change yours, make it 3, 4, 5, until you get what you want. Now, sometimes the E does change. The business world is not what it used to be. The economy is not what it used to be. The world climate. After 9-11 in the United States, you know, people's sense of safety is not what it used to be. Travel is not what it used to be. So you do have to change your R in order to get a response you might have gotten before. So we want to quit blaming the event, start taking responsibility. Remember what the sign on President Truman's desk said? <laughs> the buck stops here. And it does. It stops with you. So, your point of power, taking responsibility, where is the ability to respond? Response ability. Keep changing your response to get the outcome you want. Now, just to show you how this works interactively, let me go up to, I'll go up to, is it Amber? Kimber. Kimber. I only saw the B-E-R, M-B-E-R. Kimberly. So if I say to Kimberly, Kimberly, I've been doing these seminars for 30 plus years. I literally have had over a million people in rooms like this. And of all the people I've ever met, you have to be the biggest jerk and idiot I've ever encountered in my professional career. Now, if I said that to Kimberly, how many people think that would lift her self-esteem up? <laughs> how many people think that might lower her self-esteem? OK, everyone who raised your hand just missed the first pop quiz on E plus R equals O. It is not what Jack says to Kimberly. That's the event. It's Kimberly's response. It's what Kimberly says to Kimberly when Jack stops talking that determines her self-esteem. She might say, my God, he's only known me a day and a half. How'd he figure it out so fast? Right? <laughs> if she said that, what direction would her self-esteem go? Yeah. Down. Or she might say, you know, Jack has a perceptual handicap. <laughs> he does not perceive greatness when he meets it. Which way would her self-esteem go then? Yeah, it would go up or stay the same. She might even say, you know, I'm sitting here in the front row. I'm a very attractive woman. Jack keeps looking over at me. I've hugged him twice on the hug exercises. I've got a good sense of humor. I laugh at all his jokes. He had to pick me as the example for this. I stand out for him in a room full of 300 people. For all I know, he has a crush on me. <laughs> now, which way would her self-esteem go then? It'd go up. Now, who's in charge of those thoughts? Kimberly is. See, you can pick a higher thought or you can pick a lower thought. It's up to you. Did any of you read the book, The Life of Pi? It's a best-selling book. It's a really cool book. And it's a, one of the, the, the lines in the book is you get to choose what story, what meaning you're going to ascribe to any event. And you can pick a higher story or you can pick a lower story because you're going to make them up either way. One of the most confronting days of my life when I realized I was making up all my own beliefs. And then I had this big confrontation. Oh, my God, what's the right belief to make up? <laughs> Still afraid I was going to do it wrong. 
And then you realize it's just a big game. You get to make up whatever you want. So that's the case. Why not make up good stuff? Make up stuff that uplifts you. Make up stuff that makes you feel better. Make up stuff that's going to help you get what you want. What beliefs would you need to achieve the goal you say you're setting for yourself? That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. If I said to you, Cheryl, you have green hair, would that upset you? Why not? Because I know it's not. And... Because I know it's not. Absolutely the right answer. Now, if I said to you, you know you're one of the most selfish people I've ever met in my life, and if she got upset by that, it wouldn't be because I said it. Because we've already established, if I tell her something that she knows is not true, it doesn't upset her. So if someone says something to you and it upsets you, it's not them that upset you. That person ruined my day. No, they didn't. It was your belief about yourself that you had before they ever opened their mouth that upset you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It only triggers you if you're already worried about it. If you think maybe I am too selfish, or I am not attractive, or I am too inconsiderate, or whatever, then it gets you. When your two-year-old tells you you're a bad mommy because you won't let him go to the circus, you don't freak out and go, I must be a bad mommy. You just know that's not the best thing for them to do, and they can tell you that all day long, and you can say, thank you for your perception. It's not who I think I am. Now go to your room, you know, whatever. <laughs> so the reality is everything in your life is coming at you like a two-year-old. You're in charge but you have to own it. Now, when stuff comes up, when you do get plugged in, as they say, when you do get, that's the word I want, activated by somebody, then notice it. And as we'll teach you on, uh, when Hale's here, teach a very simple method for releasing it. So you don't resist it, you just release it. Then you go back to center. Okay, so don't give your power away to others. Too many of us do that. You have a question or comment? Repeat what I said about, we'll skip about, the microphone. Go ahead. About, um, about releasing and about what you think about what others say to you. Just when you said, did you get it? The, 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 the point is that when others say things to you, if they upset you or activate you, it's not what they said that is what is upsetting you. It's the self-doubt about that part of yourself that already lives in you as doubt that is what's creating the upset. Does that make sense? Okay, so the idea is it's not them saying it. Now, see, I, I teach that nobody can make you feel anything. I can't make you feel anything. I can make it easier for you to make yourself feel something. If I tell you you're an idiot all day long, it's easier for you to go in and agree with that. But my saying that has no meaning other than what you give to it. I know I'm not an idiot. I know I'm not self. I've had people tell me, you're inconsiderate, you're too concerned with money. Money is one of the last things I care about. And yet the fact is I do talk about it a lot because a lot of people want to learn how to make more. And I know that that's not a big issue with me. So knowing that, you could say it all day long. It's not going to upset me. I just go, well, I haven't communicated well, or you're projecting something in the past, or you've got an issue there, and I let it go. Okay? But if you tell me something and I get on the bus and I'm thinking about it for the next six hours on the way to the airport and home, then I know I've got something in there I need to look at and I've got to work on and release. Catherine Lonning and I met at a, a writer's conference, and she shared this story with me. She was a um, gifted writer in her high school class, got a full scholarship to go to college somewhere in Ohio. I don't know if it was Oberlin, someplace like that. And um, she got there, and she registered for this advanced placement writing uh, seminar that was being given that year. And because of her writing ability, her entrance test, the fact that she was editor of the school newspaper, editor of the school uh, yearbook, she had written a play that was produced and all that. They said, okay, we're going to let you uh, go into this class. So she writes her first paper and she gets it back from the professor. And this was a professor who was visiting from Harvard University. And he said to her, you know, what, what she got was an F on the paper. So she said, see me after class. So she goes to see the professor and says, why did I get an F? He says, because you can't write. And she said, I've been told for the last eight years I'm one of the most gifted writers around. I mean, when I was in the 10th grade, I was scoring like, you know, sophomore year in college writing ability. So, I mean, I don't get it. So, well, I'm telling you, I'm a writing professor and your character development's terrible. You don't describe the scene all that well. The plot's weak, you know. I don't think you can write. I don't think you belong in this seminar. And she said, well, if I get an F in this class, I'll lose my scholarship. He says, well, I'll make a deal with you. If you drop out of the course now, no, that's not what he said. He said, if you promise not to write ever again, meaning you, know, you can write a history paper for school, but if you promise not to think you're a writer, 
I'll give you a passing grade, like a C plus or a B minus, just so you can keep your scholarship. I don't want to rob you of your scholarship, but you have to promise me you're not going to waste the other professor's time here at the university, and you're not going to waste your time pursuing something you have no talent for. She was so afraid of losing her scholarship, she made the deal. Now, 17 years later, she's down in Texas, living out in the boonies somewhere like near Odessa. And um, there's some desolate places in Texas. It can get really boring down there. You know, there are towns where people, they get excited when it rains because they can go down to the gas station and watch the oil slicks for them, you know, on the cement. It's kind of well, no, where she was living. And she said they were making a movie in a town next door, one of those made-for-TV movies, and everyone in town was going over to watch them make the movie because this was really cool. There were actors and directors and cameras and big entertainment. And when she went over there, everyone else was hanging out watching them shoot the stuff. She was over where the writers were because the writers were constantly retooling the script, dialogue doesn't sound right, etc. And she said, or one of the writers said, why are you over here? Why aren't you over there with everyone else? She said, well, I always wanted to be a writer. And the guy said, BS. So what do you mean BS? She said, well, if you wanted to be a writer, you would have written. She said, no, I was told on good authority, I have no talent. I said, whose authority is that? Well, there was a Harvard professor. He says, ah. Oh. He said, BS again. He said, it's ridiculous. He said, what does a Harvard professor know about writing for a living? I write for a living. My work sells. I make a living at it. Tell you what. You want to be a writer, you go home, you write a novel, you send it to me, I'll tell you if it's any good or not. So she went home and spent the next nine months writing a novel. She sent it to him. He liked it so much, he sent it to his editor in New York. She liked it so much, she called her up and said, I'd like to represent you. And I'll tell you what the name of that novel was. Romancing the Stone. <laughs> Made into a movie. Her next book was Jewel of the Nile. Two, you know, multi-million dollar movie projects. For 17 years, we lost her talent. She didn't have her talent because she took someone else's opinion of her rather than followed her own passion, followed her own heart. I was reading, and um, uh, Eric gave me a book yesterday, a present, and I was reading last night, it's a book called Success, Advice for Achieving Your Goals from Remarkably Accomplished People. I'd never seen this book. And there was a story in there by Bon Jovi and talking about how Everybody told them they'd never be any good. They didn't come from L.A. They didn't come from New York. And yet they went and they just hung with it and had passion for it. He said only one out of a, a, a million bands makes it. One out of a million. That's probably right. Every kid in the garage somewhere with their rock and roll guitar <laughs> thinks they're going to be the band. What makes it? Passion, the unwillingness to give up, persistence, hanging in there. So again, don't let anyone else steal your dream. You are responsible. They didn't talk you out of it. You let yourself be talked out of it. Nobody can make you do anything.